able to be here with us this morning. Just for your information, uh, we don't expect that these are going to fill up. The normal season ticket holders are probably not showing up today. So if during the first song or the greeting time you want to move forward, if that's good for you, we're okay with it. Uh, but we're going to begin by singing together our hymnals, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, number 26. it's our, our individual hearts that corporately join together and exalt your name. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that this morning. Lord, our desire is that we see your greatness, not our own goodness. And Lord, our desire is that you are truly exalted through our words, through our singing, uh, through our fellowship, and, and even through our thought process as we hear your word preached. And Lord, I just pray that you will be glorified. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and take a few moments and greet each other this morning. receiving that right now and you would like to, uh, feel free to sign up in the annex on your way out of the service this morning 
and we will get you on that list right away. <clears throat> Just a few other announcements. Just a reminder, if you have not turned in the surveys uh, for GROW 2015, please go ahead and do that. Uh, especially those of you who are parents, we are uh, taking those, evaluating those, and just seeing how we can uh, better serve you as a church uh, this year. Also, just a, a reminder, those of you who are young at heart, your dinner for this afternoon is still on. Uh, so if you're here for that, uh, just uh, be ready for that. That's going to be a great time. Uh, after the service. Um, after the service, go over and just check out the board over there. Uh, today is a special day where we are recognizing those in our church who have been married for 50 plus years, and so uh, you can go over there and see what they look like now and what they looked like 50 years ago, and uh, that's really cool to take some time to just notice that, and uh, you know, we, we have some really good looking people in our church, and uh, uh, they still are good looking, but you look back and see what they look like, and they've changed a little bit, not, not a whole lot, but uh, so I encourage you to do that. Someone has asked me, why, uh, why do we do that as a church? Why do we recognize those people? Um, it's not just because, um, you know, they're old, so we want to acknowledge them. That's not it. Uh, really, it's, uh, as I study God's Word, I see that marriage over and over again is a picture to us of God's love. Um, and what amazes me is that God loved me, and we'll be talking about that in our message this morning, God loves me regardless of me. And he wanted, he created marriage to show to the world around us his love. And so when we see couples who have been married 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, they're pointing to Christ uh, in the way that they uh, live, in the way that they love. And so, as a church, we want to recognize that because that's uh, just really a, a godly heritage they're leaving, not only for their kids, but also for uh, us as a church to remember. So at this time, I do want to just take some time to uh, recognize those in our uh, church who have been married 50 plus years. And so, uh, if in your bulletin you'll see a, a sheet there listing them all. They're not all able to be here, and I knew that was going to be the case with the weather, and so I am thankful to see a number of them. Uh, and, and actually, uh, someone commented that there's probably more in our 50 plus crowd than our five and under crowd here today. So, uh, that, that's just a testament to their faithfulness. But, uh, uh, if you are on this list and you have uh, are part of our church and been married 50 plus years, if you could just come to the front at this time, uh, come to the front at this time, and we just want to take a few moments and recognize you. And uh, Joe, I'm going to switch to. So if you're here, come on up. You know, be the first, be the second, however you want to do it. But uh, we just want to recognize you, and so. Uh, we'll have them come up, and I'll acknowledge them. My wife's going to help. We haven't been married 50-plus years, but she's going to help me with this. And uh, so I'll say their name, and uh, we have a flower for the prettier half of the couple. And then we have a gift card for both of them, because, you know, gift card doesn't go just to the husband. So they're coming up. I will recognize them. Okay, Charles and Barb Walters. There they are. <laughs> Marv and Ruth Yoakum. Oh, they're coming. <laughs> Making their grand entrance. Dave and Wilma Kaufman. Ernie and Joanne Whitaker. Jim and Mary Dewey, and I think only one half is here. We'll still. <laughs> Jim and Diana Hoover. <coughs> Joe 
Then ensued James. And Jean and Karen Cheryl. They're the youngsters of the group. <laughs> Let's give them a hand. Thank you, and you may be seated. We do have a few others, so look, look at your uh, bulletin. Some of our uh, couples have been married for quite some time. Uh, Lloyd and Virginia Carnes are the ones that have been married the longest, and they're getting close to 70 years, so that's quite a uh, testament to them and uh, others as well. So congratulate those. Those that are not here, we'll, we'll uh, give them their, their gifts later, but uh, I do really, truly appreciate their faithfulness, not only to each other, but to our church as well. I'm going to ask our men to come forward at this time. And we will take our morning worship off. And as they're coming, let's pray. God, we are thankful for your faithfulness. And Lord, we know that uh, as we uh, recognize these couples, uh, we understand that they are just pointing to, to you, pointing to your faithfulness to us. And Lord, that they're modeling Christ's love uh, to each other. And Lord, I pray that you will help all of us to do the same thing. I do pray, Lord, that you will bless this offering as, as we give. Lord, we know your word tells us to, to give out of our abundance back to you, to give what you have freely given to us. And Lord, I just pray that you help us to worship uh, with our gifts now. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
10 as we enter into our time of worshiping the Lord through our singing. Please join me in standing together. It is tremendous to meditate upon the love of God. We are so thankful to look around the room and see how many in our church have faithfully loved one another for 50 years or more. Yeah, it is amazing to think that even though their love was not perfect, we have a God who has loved us perfectly for far more than even 50 years. He's loved us with an everlasting love that never began and never will end. God loves us eternally. The book of James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This morning we're focusing on God's unchanging and His perfect love. We're going to begin by singing together how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. We sing together all three stanzas. Please join me in singing how deep.
into a personal prayer. Ask the Lord to open up our hearts for the preaching of His words. Consider this to condemn ourselves or to merely focus on just trying to do better, but to reflect on how perfect your love is and to apply the grace that you give us to start new and fresh each and every day, recognizing that you give us grace. Your Holy Spirit is with us. He enables us to continue on and to conform us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus, that we love more and more like you do. We are so grateful that we live by grace today. We will not be condemned for our failures. Jesus Christ has already taken that condemnation for us. And we give you all of our praise this morning. We ask as we sing to you, this would be songs from our hearts, not just from our lips. We don't want to do these merely as outward forms. We ask that you would warm our hearts to sing your praise this morning as we have sung. May the things that we sing be truth from our hearts that you receive as acceptable sacrifices of our lips. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can, please you stand with me one more time as we sing our final song, More Love to the Old Christ. More Love.
children who are in junior church may be dismissed. You can take your Bibles and turn to Hosea. Hosea chapter 11, and verse 1, where we'll be looking first this morning. Just so you kind of understand uh, when it comes to, this always comes up, uh, whether or not to have church or not. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but uh, uh, we talked about as staff. I talked to a few of our men in leadership, and we felt like um, it was important for us if we could have our worship service to do that. And uh, we don't want to be foolish, and so we want to give opportunities. That's why we canceled Sunday school for people to get out. Um, and uh, with that in mind, we do want to be wise, and so we feel it's best, um, just with the weather and everything, to not have our evening service tonight, and uh, so we will be uh, canceling for this evening. That way you can go home and stay home and not have to come out again uh, in the cold for this evening. And so uh, with that, along with that, our young people had a youth fellowship, so that will be canceled as well. So teens, just uh, take note of that as well. Um, I do want to thank those of you who prayed for me while I was gone this week. Uh, Tim Barber and I had an opportunity to go to a counseling conference, and uh, we had an excellent time. Learned a lot more than I have brain power to uh, keep in my head, so we'll have to review uh, over the next uh, few weeks of what God taught us. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Perhaps uh, one of the most famous love poems ever penned was written by Elizabeth Browning. In uh, 19, or excuse me, 1845, it's a classic, and I, I want to read it to you. It says, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and the breadth and the height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight, for the ends of the being and the ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion to put use in my own old griefs, and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose, with my lost saints. I love thee with breath, smile, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Love is a theme that spills onto the pages of many poets. Uh, and that's one that we see over and over again. Songwriters, musicians uh, constantly go to the theme of love. Love has been a major subject of great literature. How many of you, when you were younger, read Romeo and Juliet? Any of you ever play Romeo or Juliet? Anyone in here? Do we have any Romeos? Any Juliets? No. Uh, okay. Not that I saw anyway. Um, you know, it's it's common theme throughout literature. Uh, how many movies have you seen where the main focus is love? Or, or even if it's not the main focus, it's, it's a side focus. Uh, my wife and I just watched a uh, movie yesterday with our kids, Robin Hood. You know, the little cartoon one? Yeah. And even in that, a kid's one, love is a, uh, a theme throughout out it. Uh, love, everyone loves a love story, don't we? You love hearing about stories, especially if they end in a positive way. One of the truest, uh, truly greatest love stories in all of history existed between Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert. Uh, Victoria became England's queen in 1837 after the death of her uncle. Three years later, she married Prince Albert. Um, at first, he was not uh, very popular. He was German. And that bothered a lot of the English people why she would marry a, a German. Uh, but yet, over time, he, began, uh, he became admired for his honesty, his diligence, and his devotion to not only the country, but his family as well. The couple had nine children, and uh, were very busy with nine children. Uh, Victoria loved her husband deeply. She relied on him for everything. Uh, 21 years after they were married, he passed away. Uh, she was devastated. It is said she did not make a single public appearance for three years after his death, because she was mourning so greatly. Her seclusion, in fact, generated uh, a lot of criticism to the point that there was even people that were trying to attempt to kill her. 
because of uh, this attitude she had taken. Finally, after about five years, she finally resumed her public life and, and came back in. But even that, over the rest of her life, she still mourned her husband and wore black every single day until the day of her death, which was in 1905, 40 years after her husband died. That's truly a love story. You know, love stories, whether real or fictitious, always draw people in. You know, we read, ladies love to read about love stories. Uh, but uh, when we think about love stories, let me ask you this question. What love story do you think of in the Bible? I'm sure there are many that come to mind. Uh, and I don't mean just a love story between a husband and wife. I mean even beyond that. You know, maybe the first thing that comes to your mind is Solomon and uh, the, the book of Song of Solomon and the, the description that he has of the love he has for his beloved. Maybe you think of, uh, beyond husband and wife, maybe you think of individuals like Jochebed. You know, Jochebed, uh, she defied the king's command. That king commanded that all newborns would be killed. And she, uh, because of her love for, for Moses, she, she defied that. Her love was courageous. Her love was self-sacrifice and self-denying, creative. She loved her son. Maybe you think of Ruth and Naomi and how Ruth said, you know, to Naomi, I will go wherever you go. I will dwell with you. You think of those. While the stories there are maybe good examples of individual love, I say that the greatest story of love is God's love for his people. God's love for the nation of Israel specifically. You know, the history of this nation of Israel is scattered throughout the Bible, and really, it's a mind-boggling story. I want to call your attention to Hosea, and we want to look at God's description of His love. We see in Hosea chapter 11, and verse 1, it says, uh, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. You know, this, this incredible story... Uh, is not one that you would usually think of when we talk about the topic of love. When we think about love, you don't usually necessarily turn to Jose. In fact, maybe some of you are offended that when we're here recognizing faithful marriages, we're going to look at a very unfaithful marriage. And yet God used it to describe his love. And Jeremiah, the prophet, said this, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know, throughout Scripture, we see described God's love for His people of Israel. And so I just want to take a few moments and illustrate this great example of love that we see in this book of Hosea. That we see uh, in, in this pa these pages. It's, it's fact. It's a history uh, story. But it's, it's real. So in order to understand this, I really want, what I want to do is I want to take you back to that time. Now, some of the things that I want to share here in the next few minutes are speculation, but I think they're very uh, probable considering what Scripture does tell us. So if you can, as at all possible, take yourself back to Israel at this point. Imagine we're in Israel. Maybe there's different images you have in your mind right now, but imagine we're outside of a, a, a large village somewhere in the middle of Israel. Israel at this time is enjoying success. Monetarily, things are going well. Spiritually, not so much. But for most people, they're so apathetic, they don't really even care. It just seems like everything's going well, their businesses are going well, uh, it's profitable time, and so everything's going okay. And here we find ourselves outside of this village. It's, a, it's in the middle of the afternoon. You know, the sun is very bright, and at, at this uh, time and this location, it would, be, uh, it would just scorch your skin immediately. It's just hot. And here they are, and you see, as you walk around, you see merchant shops all over the place, people selling their wares. You probably hear uh, the, the uh, sounds of the people trying to haggle for a better price. You know, maybe we can get a better price here, and they're arguing over those sort of things. As you move closer to the center of town, you become aware of the sounds of many voices down the road. You go to see what it is, and as you gather, there's... There's a group of men gathered around. In the middle of these group of men, you hear one voice standing above the others, and it's the voice of an auctioneer. You've arrived in time to see the auction of, this, of a slave woman. As you look at her, you see here's a woman who's just tattered, beaten by life. 
Her head is down. The auctioneer with his hoarse voice shouts out, I have a bid for five shekels for this slave woman. Who will give me seven? Someone on the left says, I'll, I'll give you seven. The bidding continues, and he's trying to get a higher and higher amount. And you begin to be curious, who is this woman? Who is this woman who is standing there and is the object of such shame? People are looking at her with disgust. People are saying nasty things about her. Who is she? How has she uh, got to the point where she's standing in front of a village being auctioned off? The man sitting, standing next to you said, you want to know who she is? She's no stranger to this part. In fact, everyone knows who she is. She's the town adulteress. Thinking, wow. He goes on, he says, she has the reputation in these parts actually of being the best prostitute in the area. The auctioneer yells out, look at this woman. She's got to be worth more than seven shekels. Someone else, give me more. You look at her and you see the sadness in her eyes. You look closely, you can see a hint of a former beauty that's no longer there. Something's changed in her. Another bystander says, you know, I, I heard she used to be married. Married? And that comes as a surprise, and then all of a sudden opens up a whole bunch of other questions, and, and the bystander goes on to say, yeah, in fact, she was married to the preacher. Wow. And folks uh, begin to just talk about her, and they say, you know, she was trouble even before they got married. And another one says, you know, I, I'm told they have three kids, and it's kind of even a question if the kids are his or not, or maybe they're someone else's. It's, it's unclear, but we know for this for sure that she's been with a lot of different people. You stand there, you look at this poor creature at the center of attention, and you realize that what, what once was a beautiful young woman, what once was free, is now someone who is just completely miserable. And she once knew the warmth and the tenderness of, her, uh, of a loving husband, but not now. She once experienced the joy of holding and loving three children. She was loved, she was cared for, she was provided for. Her every need was met, but not now. The auction is going slowly. The woman's owner was willing to wait as long as possible to get as much as he possibly could for her because in his mind she was worthless. The crowd around was starting to feel she was getting what she deserved. The auctioneer pipes in again. He says, gentlemen, I have 10 shekel bid. Isn't there anyone who's willing to give me 11? Anyone at all for this woman? Finally, he says, all right, ten shekels it is, going once, going twice. Suddenly, from the back, somewhere in the crowd, a large uh, or a loud voice yells out, I'll give you fifteen shekels and ten bushels of barley. Everyone's jaw drops. They can't believe what they just heard. Everyone in the crowd turns to see as this man slowly walks forward. What kind of man would dare to spend that kind of money on such a worthless woman? He takes the 15 shekels and he hands it to the seller and he promises, I'll, I'll bring you the barley later. He walks over to the slave woman and her head is still down. She hasn't taken the time to look up and she expects, as is the case in most of these, that the rough hands of her new owner will grab her and throw her to the ground and pull her through town while everyone laughs and jeers at her. But instead, what reaches up is a man with tender arms. He touches her and he says her name, Gomer. She hasn't heard that name said with love in a long time. She's broken. She turns around to face the man who just said her name, and her eyes grow wide as can be. Can it really be? Once again, he says, Gomer. And tears begin to trickle down her face, and she says, Hosea, is that really you? He says, yes. Gomer, we're going home. I love you. You're my wife. We're going home. 
The stunned crowd watches in silence as Hosea grabs her, carefully takes her off of the, away from the crowd and walks away. As, as they're walking away, the crowd is able to hear her say what it says in Hosea. You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I be with you. The love and compassion is there. You know, this story seems so outside of our understanding in today. You know, today it's uh, as soon as, you know, someone hears, oh, there was unfaithfulness. Well, you need to get away from that person. Don't show them any love. Yet why did Hosea do this? Look back at Hosea, and I'll put the verses on the screen if, if you don't want to turn there. But Hosea chapter 1. Starting in verse 2, the Lord comes and says to him, to Hosea, Go, take to yourselves a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom, for the land committed great whoredoms by forsaking the Lord. And it's such harsh language, but the reality of it is this. God comes to him and says, I want you to take an unfaithful wife so that you can show to uh, my nation, my people, that they're being unfaithful to me. So he, Hosea, went and took Gomer. He goes and he takes her, and you can read through chapter 1. We studied this on a Wednesday night in our adult Bible study, but you go through and they have three kids. And again, the question is, you know, whether they're his or not, it's not clear in Scripture. There's some question on that. But they have three kids, and then after having those three kids, again, she leaves and she becomes unfaithful to him, and, and she goes. You know, the story then takes a twist in chapter 3, what I was just talking about just a few moments ago. It says uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord comes again to Hosea and says, Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is adulterous, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. That idea of cakes of raisins was, was something that was done in a and in the religion, the false religion of the day, it was, a, it was a part of their pagan worship. He says, they've turned their back on me and they've gone and they're serving these other gods. They're involved in these other uh, religious practices that aren't following God. And so God says, oh, Hosea, as a picture of that, I want you to go and I want you to take your wife again. She's been unfaithful to you. She's hurt you. I understand that. The lover. So what does he do? I mentioned this a moment ago, so he went and he bought her back. You know, who is this prophet? And what would lead him to act in the way he does towards this woman? Just a quick uh, introduction who he is. Hosea was the prophet of the Lord. He began ministering, as I said, in, in Israel, uh, the northern kingdom, at the time when the nation was headed full speed towards uh, judgment. God had, was predicting and was telling and through other uh, prophets that the fierce and fearsome Assyrian army was going to come in and take them captive. Thousands would be slaughtered. Thousands more would be taken into captivity and, and be, become slaves. Judgment was certain. And Hosea had the task of warning the people, judgment's coming. And that was his job. And if you read through Hosea, that's what he's telling them over and over again. Pay attention. God's judgment is coming upon you. But before the judgment came, God wanted one last time, one more opportunity to pour out His love. God wanted one more opportunity to do that. As you read through Hosea, it becomes very clear of God's judgment. But despite the dire situation of God's judgment, Hosea is giving us a beautiful picture of God's unconditional love. He not only tells Israel that God is holy, but he reminds them that God is love. He not only tells them that sin is breaking God's law, but he also reminds them that sin is breaking God's heart. The story of Hosea's marriage to Gomer is intended to reflect God's unconditional love. And I just scratched the surface of the story, and I challenge you to read it more. But as we look at that, we ask, how could Hosea love Gomer after all she had done? But greater than that, because the ultimate story is how could God love Israel after the way he had treated, they had treated him? And I think this story gives us, points out three aspects of God's love. And if you have your uh, sheet that, in your bulletin, you can 
uh, take notes on it. It's there um, for you to do that. And on the back is a devotional you can do as a family this week. We see three aspects of God's love that I want to point out just in a few minutes this morning. First of all, God's love for Israel was without reason. I mean, to say that God's love for Israel was illogical is an understatement. I mean, what God asked Hosea to do did not make sense. I mean, as you study Scripture over and over again, you see God speaks out against adultery. God speaks out against sin of unfaithfulness. God tells His people to to not be a part of that. In fact, God hates divorce. He despises divorce. Yet, He says, there is that one clause, if, if you must divorce, do it only for the purpose of an adulterous marriage. But yet, in the midst of that, God comes to Hosea and says, Hosea, I want you to marry a woman who is going to be unfaithful to you. I want you to do that. Why? Because I want to reflect what I am doing for my people. And you look and you think it's totally illogical. Why would God ask a man to marry a woman like this? And really, that's the point. God's love to Israel didn't make sense. Now, why would God commit himself to a group of people he knew would be unfaithful to him? I mean, not just here, way back. I mean, when God uh, first called his people, you look over and over again how many times they were unfaithful. I mean, you even start with, with God calling Jacob and said, you're going to you know, be the leader of this great nation. I'm going to change your name to Israel. And what did Jacob do? He lied and deceived. I mean, look at God calls Moses, and, and, and Moses was a, was a you know, murderer. But God used him anyway, and he calls all the people, and he takes them and does these unbelievable things, and yet through the process, what do they do? They reject God. They, they complain over and over and over again. Why would God choose a nation that he knew was going to be unfaithful to him? I mean, ask yourself, would you marry a mate who, going in, you knew would not be faithful to you? No. And we have all these couples up here we recognize for 50 years of marriage. Okay, if they on their wedding day looked across at the person across from them and said, you know, I know this person's going to be unfaithful to me. You know what? They wouldn't marry them. That's why they're able to be here after 50 years. Because they love each other and they trust each other. But according to this story, God's love is irrational. It doesn't make sense. Not logical. But not only that, God's love for Israel didn't have any disclaimers. I can't really explain that. A word that we often hear used to describe God's love when we talk about the subject of God's love is the word unconditional. Meaning that it's unqualified, it's absolute, it's without limitation, it's without conditions. God loved Israel despite their failures, their, their, their disgraces. God loved them no matter what. God's love is unconditional, without conditions, which means God loves us not based on what we do, but based on who He is. We looked at that last week in 1 John where it says God is love. There's no way that you can take that away from who He is. You can't remove love from God. It's impossible. That's who He is. You know, and, and God says, I love you unconditionally. However, just like with the nation of Israel, God's love is not without demands. Now, the demands do not mean this. It's not this idea of, I will love you as long as you do this. No, he says, I will love you despite what you do, yet I want you to love me. He told the nation of Israel, he said, uh, I, I will bless you and I will bless those that bless you as long as you follow my way. But if you don't follow my way, then I will judge you. But even in my judgment, I'll still love you. I'm doing it for your own good. And he says to them, I will love you. And so we see the concept in, in Hosea and throughout the Bible of what we would call tough love. Now, sometimes love has to be tough and demanding of responsibility. Otherwise, it's not really genuine love. You know, if, we say I, if I say I love my kids and, and yet I don't um, encourage them and punish them when they do wrong, then I'm not genuinely loving. When you read the entire story of Hosea's relationship with Gomer, 
In its application to the nation of Israel, you pick up on this theme of tough love throughout. Now, God is responding to nation, the nation's sin and disobedience by dealing with them with toughness, but also with compassion. Let's look at a few verses that talk about that. Look at Hosea chapter 2 and verse 6. Notice, notice what it says there. In Hosea 2, 6, it says, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. Now, you have to admit, that's pretty tough language, isn't it? I mean, listen to it for a moment. Okay, I'm going to hedge up your way with thorns. Okay, what, what kind of parenting technique is that? You know, okay, you say to your child, don't go over there. And so to keep you from doing that, I am going to put up a wall of fire so you don't go by. How about that? You know, we feel like bad parenting. Okay. Well, that's what God does. He says, you know what, I, I love you. And so in order to do that, I'm going to allow you to go through this pain. I'm going to put up this, this wall that makes it difficult for you to get by because I know it might hurt you. I know it might be painful, but I love you. And that's why I'm doing that. We see in the next verse, in chapter 2 and verse 7, he says this, She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it is better for me then than now. And basically the object of tough love is reducing resources uh, down to the point that there isn't any. And he's saying in this passage, referring to Gomer and Hosea, but he's referring to the nation of Israel, and he's saying, I, I want you to get to the point where you realize that the only really true love that you're going to receive is from me. And I'm going to put up every obstacle possible. And you know, God does that in our lives at times. And some of you as parents have had to administer tough love to your kids. Um, this past week, as I went to a conference, one of the speakers got up, and he's Pastors a church in Kentucky of, I think, close to 2,000 people. He's a well-known, well-known speaker, and, and uh, he got up and he, he told us a story. Uh, he spoke on parenting and uh, counseling parents pr- primarily. He talked about the fact that he had five kids, and his two oldest kids, both, uh, who now are in their 20s, had turned their back on God. With a broken heart, he explained what he went through. And, and how uh, God had uh, used that. But, you know, he also talked about the idea of tough love. And he said, you know, there was a year where his son, who's now, I think he said, mid-20s. And he said there was a year where his son uh, decided that he um, just basically wanted to live uh, a, a horrible existence. He moved into a rundown trailer with five other guys and just spent his existence doing drugs and alcohol. And he said, you know what, I, he goes, people kept saying to me, why don't you go and rescue your son? And he said, because I love him too much to bail him out. And, and you know, and I thought, you know, that is what we see here in this passage. God is saying, to the nation of Israel, you are about to be taken captive and I'm not going to just bail you out. Because I want you to turn to me. I want you to realize that the only possible solution to your pain and and agony is to come back to me. We see another verse in uh, Hosea chapter 6 and verse 5, just a few pages over, it says this, Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. I mean, hewn by the prophets, slain by the words of my mouth. Sooner or later, he's saying this, I want you to stand up and say something that's obvious. Number one, I can't run from God. Number two, I have nowhere else to go but God. God's love doesn't have disclaimers, yet it does have uh, tough love, expectations in that regard. Third aspect I want to notice about God's love in this passage is that God's love for Israel was about redemption. It was about redemption. In order to understand fully God's purpose in dealing with them, you have to look at the last chapter of this story. In Hosea chapter 14, if you look there, Hosea chapter 14, God pleads with them. 
God begs them, and he says in Hosea 14, verse 1, he says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. He says to them, please return, but then he goes on in the next verse, he says, Take with you the words and return to the Lord, say to him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good. We will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. We talked about that a, a few weeks ago, how God... Uh, it demands on us the vows of our lips, our praise. You know, amazing, not only does God give them the invitation to return, as, as Hosea did to Gomer, even though Israel was unfaithful, even though Israel had followed other gods, even though Israel had done all these wicked things, God comes to them and says, hey, come back, return. But not only that, though, he gives them the repenting prayer. He's like, when you come back, this is what you can say. <laughs> Here's how you can get forgiveness. And then he follows that up with a promise. Look down at verse 4. Uh, and he says there, uh, in, in verse 4, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. Wow. Isn't that amazing? My anger has turned from them. Did God have every right to be angry? Yes. Did Hosea have every right? Right. To be angry at Gomer, yes. Did he have every right to divorce her? Yes. Did he have every right to turn his back on her? Yes. But he didn't. And God wanted us to see that that is how he loves his nation of Israel. Maybe you're here and you say, okay, what does that mean for me? I don't live in Israel. So how does that apply to the 21st century American? I'm going to just take a few moments and, and look at God's love to us that I think that we can base on this story what we see also expressed uh, later on in the Bible. First of all, like with Israel, God loves you despite you. God loves you despite you. Romans, very familiar verse, but Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that we were lovable. It's not that we were even likable. But God, in his love, looked down and says, I would like, love you, and I would, because of my love, like to redeem you. That's amazing to see. You know, God loves us so much, yet how uh, often do we forget about that? Well, you know, I'm not like the nation of Israel. I'm a good person. There's no, uh, you know, God doesn't look down and say, oh yeah, you're right, you're a good person. No, he loves us even while we were sinners. The second aspect of it, God's love involves grace. Just like uh, in the story of Hosea uh, and Gomer, it was, it was an incredible grace that Hosea said, I am willing to forgive you. It is an incredible grace that God said to the nation of Israel, I'm willing to forgive you. God also does the same thing with us. In Timothy, it says, And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. It's because of the love of God that uh, His grace overflows to you. I mean, do you feel uh, the grace of God evident in your life? You should. The third thing that we want to look at is God's love demands humility. Just like with Israel, God's love demands humility. And the people of Israel were told, come back to me. And God even said, when you come back, here's the repenting prayer I want you to pray. Come back and get on your knees and say, God, I, I want you to take away all this iniquity. And we have to come to God humbly. If you want to turn there, you can. or I have it on the screen. James chapter 4. I'm going to read uh, seven verses from James chapter 4. Because I think we see this in that passage. Notice what it says there. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? And what is it that causes fights today? And I'm not talking like, you know, army against army, although that's included. I'm talking about even, even take it down to reality. What causes fights in your own home? This, this is, you know, marriage counseling 101 right here. Okay? Why, why do you and your husband fight? You say, because my wife is a difficult woman. 
I doubt it. It's probably you. But why do you fight? It tells us in the passage what causes fights. Look what it says next. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? In other words, he says, isn't it this, that, that you have desires in your own heart that your wife doesn't have? And you want your own way. He goes on, he says, uh, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. So I haven't done that. Well, remember what Jesus said. If you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. He says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Then notice what he says next. Doesn't this kind of parallel back to Hosea? He says, you adulterous people. Woo! I mean, those are fighting words. You know, if I walked up to one of you and said, you're an adulterer, you would, you know, you'd be ready to come to blows with me, wouldn't you? But here, James, through the inspiration of God, says, you adulterous people, you say, well, he's talking to a bunch of unsaved people, isn't he? No. If you were to read James up till chapter 4, there's six times where James uses the term brethren. He is speaking here to Christians, and he's saying to them, you adulterous people. He says, he says, you know, why is there fighting? It's because all you want is your own passions. Why do we do what we do? It's because we, uh, there's a phrase that the counseling conference we went to this week, they said over and over again, why do we do what we do? Because we want what we want. And that's, that's the truth. That, that, that's what it's about. That's what James is saying. Why is it that you have fights in your home? Why is it you fight with your kids? Why is it that you have conflict at work? It's because you want your own way. And here he comes and he says, you're a bunch of adulterous people. Don't you know that your friendship with the world is enmity with God? Don't you understand that? That when you want to get your own way and do your own thing, you are just God's enemy. Notice what he says next. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Notice what he goes on and says, Or do you suppose it, it no purpose that the scripture says he yearned jealously over the spirit that he has had made to dwell in us? Do we see a glimpse there again of Hosea? He says, Don't you understand that God is jealous over you? Now, does my wife have a right to be jealous of me if I am uh, unfaithful to her? Yes. She does. God says, you know what? Don't, why does it shock you that I'm jealous over you? You're doing your own passions, your own desires. You're following the lust of this world instead of following me. Why, why does it shock you that I'm jealous over you? But then notice what he says next. But he gives more grace. Even though I continue to pursue my own way, even though I continue to do my own thing, God says here, you know what? I'm going to continue to pour grace on you. More grace and more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, the nation of Israel sat there, and Hosea was preaching and saying, hey, Turn from your wicked way. Turn to God. And, and God will save you. Do Come back to him with repentance and God will save you. But if you know the end of the story in Hosea, what did they do? The people put their fists up in the air and said, God, we are not changing who we are. And what happened? The Assyrian army came in. And because of uh, their, their pride and arrogance, God judged them. You know, but like Israel, God's love demands our humility today. Are you humble before God? He goes on in the next verse, and he says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Just like Israel, God's love demands our humility. And then the last thing I want to point out is our love reveals God. You know, the nation of Israel was... was told by God to be a testimony to the nations. They were supposed to be a testimony to the nations of something different. 
They were supposed to be uh, something where people could look and say, there's something different about these people. Why? Because there's something different about their God. Uh, in, in 1 John, it said that we looked at this verse last week, but it says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In other words, what it's saying there is that our love is supposed to reveal who God is and to reveal uh, what we know about God. I mentioned this a few moments ago, but our marriages are supposed to do the same thing. You say, I thought you were going to talk about marriage today. We're going to deal with marriage. Here it is. This is the bit here. Okay, our marriages are supposed to do the same. God tells us we're supposed to, uh, as husbands, love our wives like Christ loved the church. Now, people of today maybe don't catch the glimpse of the fact that Christ loved the church. I mean, Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago and died, so maybe people don't see it. But you know what? Uh, what he's saying here is that as you love your wife and those around you see it, it points to Christ. It points to who Christ is and what Christ did for us. Let me ask you, what is your love revealing? You know, as I studied through this passage over the last few weeks, um, it just uh, this book of Hosea has become um, one of my favorites because it humbles me. It humbles me to think that my sin uh, has caused there to be a divide in my relationship with God, and yet He loves me enough to draw me back in. And the same thing is true for you. Yet, He asked me to be humble and to reflect Him. I challenge you to do that. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for Your Word. Lord, um, I personally am so thankful for your love. Um, even over the last few days, I can look back and see times where my flesh crept in, my pride crept in, um, conflict was created, and, and it's not a shock because you tell us in your word that that comes from proud hearts, and not humble hearts. But as we come humbly before you, Lord, you tell us that you will you will gladly take us back in and love us. Or that you will continue to love us because you never stopped loving us. Lord, I pray that you help us as people today to reflect on your love. And we praise you. We ask that you be glorified through our lives. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to have Pastor Nate come and uh, we'll have an invitation song. And then we'll close our service. Please stand together with me and we're going to sing. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son. service this morning, so go home, stay warm, and uh, not have an evening service this morning, yes. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> We're not going to have an evening service this evening either, so <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, but uh, 
thank you for coming, and I'm going to have Pastor Nate close our service with prayer after we sing one more verse. <laughs> to pray for her recovery and then to pray for Ruth Cummings who is traveling home now on the bus from visiting her father in Louisiana. Let's close together in prayer. Our God, we are so grateful in coming face to face with the light of your word this morning that your spirit is with us to encourage us and to teach us from your word. We thank you for the faithful preaching from your word and we just ask that as we leave today, that your word would grip us and change our hearts. Help us to grow together as a church in your word this year. May each message be something that uh, digs down deep and changes us. This morning, Father, we lift up together those who are not able to be with us this morning. And we miss them and ask that you would bless them and give them grace for their needs today that they have and for this week. We pray for safety for any who are traveling, especially for Ruth and her traveling. Uh, and she's home to see her father who looks like he doesn't have much time left. We just pray for your grace for her, comfort for her. We thank you for the safety you've given her thus far. And we pray for Sheila as well with her recovery. And we give you the praise for the successful surgery. And we are grateful for that. We ask that during her uh, downtime you would give to her encouragement from your word from your people uh, with visits and encouragement uh, but also that father you would uh, through the weakness that she has magnify yourself we ask that for all of our struggles this week the trials we face we don't want them and yet we realize that this is the way that you make us more like your son jesus christ so would you please not allow us to waste our trials but to look to you may your spirit give us grace encourage us Help us to make wise decisions. You would bring yourself glory in our weaknesses this week. Please, we ask for safety as we travel in the weather. I'll be with each one as uh, they go to their homes. We pray that you would bless the young at heart during their meal. May the fellowship uh, be good. Uh, may they be encouraged by one another and the faith that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. 